Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this community discussion. So this will be a bit of a different format than what we've hosted previously in these sessions. And I wanted to share our expectations for the session today. So uh, we are from the National Center for Data Services and uh, wanted to host this community discussion for people to share uh, questions and responses to the NIH data management and sharing policy that will go into effect in January. So for this uh, session, we'll have an hour and we have three main question segments for this hour. So for each segment, someone will present a question and it'll be about the data management and sharing policy. And then everyone uh, here will have a minute to think about this question and think about how you might respond to that. And then we'll share a document. Um, Nicole will put the link to the document in the chat. And you will have a chance to write out like a brief response in the document. And that way we can see what everyone's thoughts are. And then we'll also ask everyone to vote on the responses that we see so that we can um, pick out uh, the most popular responses people want to hear. And um, as you all are sharing your written thoughts, you can vote for your top three favorite responses by putting a plus sign next to the response. And then we will address those responses by unmuting people. So um, if you write a response, be aware that you might be asked to speak to that response, um, but you don't have to write a response if you don't feel comfortable doing so. And let me show you what I mean here with this document. So, as an example, if the sample question is uh, best type of summer reading book, people putting their answers in, oh, this is good, people are using it as a test box. So that's great, you can continue doing so, and we can add columns on the left um, with the little plus sign if we need to add rows for your names. And um, your comments will be in the middle, your name's on the left so we know who to call on and then the votes will be on the right. So you can vote on the right with a plus sign um, to indicate your favorite responses. So feel free to test that out on the sample question. Uh, have fun with that. And we will go ahead and get started with our first question asker. Uh, Justin, sorry, one last thing before we do, it looks like Colin user two has their hand up. Uh, do we want to take that on? Okay. I'm fairly certain that's Michelle Hazlett. Oh, she was fabulous. not able to get the link. So, yeah, I'll let her in as a panelist. Thank you, Jen. Oh, there we go. So they can unmute now. Um, and hopefully everything will be OK with that. OK, so our first question comes from Mary Ellen Sloan from Middle Tennessee State University. If you'd like to um, introduce yourself and share your question on the data management and sharing plan. Thank you. My unmute moved when I started sharing, so uh, thanks for bearing with me. and. So, that presentation look okay? Uh, we saw it for a brief second and now I just see a black screen. So maybe exiting the presentation and trying again. Is that you seeing it now? Ooh, we see reader mode now. Okay. Stop sharing. Of course, of course it worked in the test, right? <laughs> yeah, um, maybe the escape button and then maybe clicking on the first slide and then maybe hitting the presentation button to share. There we see we could see it now. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I was really excited to see that you're having this forum and it's uh, such an interactive uh, opportunity to talk directly with you all and with the community. 
And today my question is, how is NIH working to develop curricula for data sharing? Establishing data sharing and data literacy curricula at all levels could help the adoption of the sharing plan requirements. What efforts are underway, if any, to develop and share such curricula? And uh, as we all know, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of work being done in this area. But I think that in terms of really working with PIs and working with students who may be reusing data, it would be helpful for me to check in with what is actually required and how are uh, how is research currently or in the future going to comply with the data management and sharing policy. And also uh, uh, supplemental policies uh, related to divisions of the NIH. So in that regard, I went to work looking for um, other models of curricula that perhaps could be used. And there's a recent uh, guidebook, How to Be Fair with Your Data, and it lays out many levels of uh, lesson plans and principles and learning outcomes that could be used as a model in this regard for developing such curricula. Uh, another source, which I think is really fantastic, it, it perhaps uh, could be in this quickly uh, changing ecosystem a little bit dated because it was from 2016, but what I really like about this matrix is that it really scaffolds the data information literacy competencies across all levels. And I think this is really important because you do have, you know, the data steward level where uh, librarians such as myself may be working with our offices of research to help develop data management plans. But then you are also looking at how graduate students and even undergraduate students may be reusing data and may be helping researchers to develop or, you know, faculty to develop data of their own research projects. So I thought that was a really uh, comprehensive matrix. Of course, I just have some teaser screenshots here. Um, another thing related to ethical data governance is the Civic Data Library of Context. And there's lots of other resources out there related to ethical use of data, particularly um, indigenous data. Uh, but this is a really great uh, demo that they've developed where you could perhaps adopt this in the context of a data literacy uh, curricula to help students understand or, or PIs or whomever to understand uh, how to develop metadata that is based on inclusive practices and to really understand uh, ethical uses of, of sharing data. And then I just have some additional sources here and many of you may be familiar with some of these. Uh, of course, Kristen Briney's great work, Data Management for Researchers. There's also, um, at the end, a guide from SAGE that I think is a little bit more focused on social science data, but may be useful for several purposes. And then um, I just want to mention the Carlson and Johnston book because I believe my understanding is that that really developed out of an ILMLS grant for data information literacy. And I really think that a renewal of, of some kind of effort in that regard may be very timely at this time. So I just being cognizant of time, that's uh, the end of my presentation. And I'm gonna, should I go ahead and stop sharing now, Justin? Yeah, you can stop sharing. I'll I'll try and pull up the document so we can all see what's going on here. Okay. Um, now we can take a moment and uh, fill in um, your response to that, and also vote on your response. Vote on the responses that are given.
All right, so we see some responses. Feel free to keep adding those in. I saw one with 16 votes, so um, let's start with Sandy Bates. Would you like to express more of your response? Um, we'll try and unmute you at the moment. I got her unmuted. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm glad to see Nina Exner's on the call. I went to her fabulous MLA presentation, but then we started talking with the people above us and they really want some kind of sample. And I know that the word is they're not available because nobody's written them yet because it's not actually a plan that's technically required yet. But um, their, their question was, what are they going to look like for the different areas of research like biomedical if they're omics a lot of the discussion was nobody's going to want mine because i'm doing this weird animal study um, it's really hard when we're not data management librarians we're trying to get up to speed on it so having something prepared or something they can read through that would give them an idea i mean we talked through the um, tools that Nina talked about, Dr. Exner talked about in her presentation, but um, kind of swimming upstream a little bit. So hoping there will be some like NIH produced materials on this videos, training, any of those kinds of things um, would certainly be helpful. And if there are any um, panelists that wanted to respond to anything that we hear from responses, you can feel free to do so. Thank you for sharing. Um, I see a lot of activity down here. Can we hear from Carrie Sewell? Sorry about that, just working on the unmuting and there it is. Sorry for the delay. Yeah, um, my question is about the extent to which the NIH is going to produce um, more in-depth training videos on the different pieces of this policy for researchers and particularly around issues like um, not just the data management plan, but choosing a repository and all of those things because uh, while Within my library, we've been discussing ways to deliver those individual sessions. I do have some PIs who have um, responded to that by saying, well, I'd really like to get that training directly from the NIH. And while as a librarian, I kind of get my hackles up about that. Um, I do know that that still might be important if that's their preferred route. So I, I was wondering kind of how in-depth will any NIH produced um, curricula or self-directed modules be to help these researchers who want it from the horse's mouth? All right, I'm trying to figure out who might be next. 14, 9, 12. Yeah, uh, there's quite a big response here from Lisa. If we could try and uh, mute her and then hear from one other before we move on to the next question. Great, Lisa, you're unmuted. 
you can hear me. Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, thanks. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of things um, that the NIH is doing has done. Um, so I put a couple of links in the document. Um, yesterday, um, NLM and the Office of Data Science Strategy hosted a webinar with um, the Data Curation Network. So we had, um, I think a couple of them are even on this call right now, four excellent presenters from the DCN talking about um, uh, sort of best practices for a few different things related to data management and sharing. So while this is not necessarily guidance from the NIH itself, um, I, I think you could probably point people there and I think it would be very useful. So that's not posted yet, but it will be on the link that I um, put in the box. Um, and then I also wanted to bring awareness to um, the Office of Science Policy and Office of Extramural Research will be hosting um, two webinars for the public in the next couple months. Um, one that is, I think, sort of more of an intro, and then uh, one that I think is going to be more of a deep dive into, um, you know, maybe some of the questions that, um, you know, you all are raising and that you're probably hearing from your investigators. Um, with regard to sort of more specific guidance from NIH, um, I do not speak on behalf of the Office of Science Policy or um, the Office of Extramural Research, but my uh, sort of understanding from talking with them is that they, um, it's a challenge to, to give really specific guidance because NIH is so big, 27 institutes and centers that fund all different kinds of science and research. And so there's not really, um, you know, a lot of guidance and advice that's really one size fits all. So I think that they um, have tried to focus more on things that are broadly applicable, um, but I think, um, you know, all of what you all are raising is really good to know, and I uh, will certainly take that back to my colleagues in those offices, um, and hopefully we can get some more materials developed. Thanks, everybody. Uh, this is turning out great. I know it's a little uh, bit of activity going on in the document, so some people might not be able to access it, so sorry about that. Um, we do want to move on to give uh, time to our other questions. So uh, let's hear from Michelle Brewer from Walters Kluwer if you want to introduce yourself and uh, your question. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me and see my slide? We can hear you, um, but maybe try sharing the slide Share. again. Got it. How's that? Oh, we can see it. Okay. Hi, um, I'm a medical librarian. I've worked for more than 30 years um, and currently working for a medical publisher, Walters Kluwer. You may know us, Lippincott, Ovid, for example. And my question is, um, what can publishers do to help or facilitate this policy change with their society journals and their publishers and authors? Any suggestions? And I've Listen to a lot of webinars. It sounds like all of you folks have too. And there's many varied approaches um, to data, um, especially by publishers, um, you know, mentioning others like Elsevier, Wiley, Springer Nature Plus. So I would think some are farther along than others um, with handling data and working with their authors, um, especially in um, the final published version. And I'm wondering if anyone has checklists, best practices publishers should be aware of, um, or recommendations or organizations, you know, publishers should be aware of to serve as models. And coincidentally, after I submitted my question yesterday, we launched our Lippincott data repository. And I put the link up here and a link to the press release if anyone is interested. Um, and I also can um, show it to you. And obviously there's no content yet because we just, we just did it yesterday. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what you folks could help publishers with in regard to this policy. Thank you very much. So we'll give everyone a chance to respond. Um, if you can't get into the document now, we will leave it up and so, and we can email out the link so that you can see other people's responses. And if you wanted to connect with them, there's a place to leave your emails at the top of the document. So hopefully um, people can see all the information later if you can't get into the document now. Yeah, my, my thinking was there's a lot of stakeholders, you know, in this policy. And um, I just wanted to be sure that, you know, the publishers and what they need to be thinking about 
um, you know, there's some help for them as well. Should I stop sharing? Um, you can leave it up for now okay. and then I, I can okay. switch over to the responses. Okay. I don't know if people might just want a static image for now. Yeah. Okay, I see uh, Melissa Ratajewski's comment is uh, upvoted a bunch, so we'll start with Melissa. There you go. I think I'm. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, I don't have much else to say other than what's um, written there, but um, a colleague and I, Carrie Iwima for MLA, took some time and just looked at data availability statements. And a lot of the times, you know, there was errors um, in links not working, or there were so many by request or by reasonable request, or, you know, some sort of variant on that. So I think um, really putting some pushback to that and really questioning if that is um, the best um, answer would, would help with compliance for this policy. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think uh, Nina's had a lot of votes as well, so. Um... I think you're unmuted now if you'd like to speak on that. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. This is Nina. Um, I, I'm leaning into the sort of fair infrastructure and interoperability and findability and the principle that we want to have persistent identifiers linked in all sort of cross-linked across all related information objects. And so is there a chance that publishers might add a a metadata field. I'm not a metadataist. I'm a talking head, so I don't know what field that might be. But a metadata field that would specifically let handles, DOIs, pearls, and other persistent identifiers from the established repositories be linked, not just as part of a reference list, but as a and not as a supplement that has to be uploaded to the publisher's site, but to one of the established repositories, especially since some of the FOAs require a specific repo. And so we will never put it up on the publisher's data uh, site because it has to go to a certain repo in some cases. Um, and so a field that would be specific to related data would be lovely, I think. And 
I'm just going to make a comment that that sounds like something that might be um, a potential working group for NISO for a standard, but I will certainly bring that back to our publishers. Thank you very much. I also see a lot of votes for Carrie Sewell, so I will unmute Carrie. Uh, yeah, so I, I have had a lot of researchers as I've talked to them about this policy um, question whether or not it will affect um, their ability to publish papers in the first place with a journal. Their concern has been along the lines of if my data is available and then I go to submit a manuscript, will that threaten the acceptance of the paper? Um, whether or not there's any type of copyright violation. Um, and as I mentioned, while I can provide really clear information about this, if it's not very clear on pages around instructions for authors, uh -huh. that may kind of worsen that confusion. So I would love to see um, very clear information for authors related to the role of data and how it is not tied to the published article and that the journal encourages it. Ah, thank you. I'm going to bring that back as well. Thank you very much. Um, so there are a couple of high votes for our very next presenters. So I think uh, to be a little bit more equitable, I will go down the list and see if uh, Lena Bowman would like to speak on their response. I think we can unmute you from here. Okay, so you're unmuted if you'd like to speak on your response. On the lines. Oh, okay. That might be a, a no, which is fine. Um, so maybe we can uh, progress into the uh, final segment, which is actually a couple of questions related to the same topic. So we will actually have three people. Uh, oh, you accidentally remuted. Okay, let me go ahead and unmute. Okay, so you should be yeah. if you want to. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I was going to say my comment was along the lines of Melissa's and um, I actually did a big project looking for um, data using data availability statements and a lot of them just aren't very useful the way they currently are because like even if, you know, they point to someplace and aren't just like contact the researcher a lot of times the data is the data they point to is like whatever's in the graphs um so it's already aggregated it's not like the raw data um so i think like for me what would be needed to make it like as a data library and what would be needed to make them more useful would be some kind of standards about like what counts as data sharing. Um, you know, it can't just be, I'm gonna write out the data that's in my graphs and that'll be my open data. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think it is about time to go on to the third uh, set of questions here. And so we will have our remaining panelists um speak on those if do you have a order that you're going in i think that's fine okay um so you can go ahead and take it away we have uh michelle hazlett from unc chapel hill Jess newman mcdonald from university of tennessee health science center and Jen Durag from Duke University. Hi, this is Michelle Hazlett. Um, question. Hang on. Sorry, I hope you can still hear me. Yes. Great. 
My question is, what options are available for archiving personally identifiable information? We're anticipating that much of the data funded by NIH will involve personal PII and will require a higher level of security and encryption than data that we've helped to manage in the past. We have a couple of different options locally for archiving non-sensitive data, but the only option we have that we already have access to, that is, that we don't have to pay more money to access, is ICPSR. And they do have great uh, experience and long-term experience with data preservation and managing secure data, even data security at different levels of security. But we're concerned about them being sort of the main option for a broad swath of general data. Um, there's specialist archives and there's other membership archives, but what happens if like 80% of what's out there tries to go to ICPSR? What other options are institutions considering or developing um, if they're able to share what cost is involved? and what staff expertise and infrastructure do these options require? Thanks. Thank you. And do we wanna go with uh, Jess next? I can jump in on that. A little bit of background. We're at UCHSC very new to offering data services in general. So we're kind of in the stage of doing an environmental scan of what's already being offered on campus and what some of the concerns of our researchers are. And in some of the meetings that I've had with our research heavy departments, we've heard a lot of concern around having to switch up the data, data available upon request um, disclaimer that they've been using very frequently, I think, as a lot of other folks here have mentioned. And they've come to this conclusion that they need an on-campus storage and sharing solution. So they try to loop in IT and they're wanting a homegrown system because they're not finding discipline specific repositories that are in their minds appropriate for their PII or PHI. Um, we've pushed back on that a little bit, just in terms of the resources that that would require. But my question really is, how are we to advise researchers that are producing data that needs controlled access that still feel that they must have control over that access? I don't think they're willing or ready yet to hand over the gatekeeper um, role in that sense. I've heard suggestions of only sharing aggregate or de-identified data. I don't, on campus, I've not been able to identify expertise offering that sort of service. Um, so I'm curious, you know, outside of maybe sharing aggregated data, what de-identification, you know, expertise would look like, or, and, you know, as um, Michelle mentioned, what the overwhelm for some of these generalist repositories might look like that do pro provide controlled access. Uh, how can we, you know, invest in those infrastructures Who's investing in them? What is our backup? You know, if the ICPSR starts turning into a months and months and months long process for faculty. Um, so uh, there's kind of a lot of questions wrapped up in that, but you know, overall, how are we gonna deal with this um, looming issue in my mind? Thank you. And Jen has a similar question. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. So, the situation in my context here comes from many years of helping researchers acquire secondary restricted use data, either from government agencies or other research projects, you know, things like Ad Health, uh, Medicare, uh, current beneficiary survey, things like that. And the thing is, is, you know, all of this kind of wraps up together because I know how long that process takes just to acquire that kind of data and that the security on the user's end has to meet certain criteria and that can run the gamut um, all over the place as to what how people are supposed to secure data and i i guess what i'm looking at is you know if we're imagining that there's a, a sizable chunk of this data that's going to have to be restricted access what is nih going to do um, cause I mean, I know that they are investing some in generalist repositories, but most generalist repositories don't restrict data access or don't provide data enclaves like places like ICPSR or Vivli. So what are we going to do when, you know, like Jess was talking about 
a local solution isn't really practical simply because of the amount of overhead. I mean, I can speak from the just the acquiring that sort of data side of things. It takes a lot of people to keep that up and running and monitored and taken care of properly. So I I just am wondering where where are we going to find help for this that's practical that isn't going to fall back on institutions to figure it out themselves because we're going to end up with bottlenecks that could potentially be years long. Thank you all. Um, I posted the short form of the questions in the document, so we will take a minute to have people respond there. All right, I'll switch back to sharing the screen. And <clears throat> I think we can have um, Lisa unmute to address her response. Everyone. Um, sorry, my dog just arrived and started coughing in here. So, sorry for any background noise. Um, so, yeah, so I just shared a link to. Um, a page that uh, we run at LLM um, through, uh, on behalf of the Trans NIH Biomedical Informatics Coordinating Committee, um, which um, maintains a list of repositories. It's currently split up into two because it's so long and not very interactive, but we're working on a redes redesign for that. That's going to get everything onto one page, include new search and browse and filter functionality. And um, one of the things that we're doing with that to sort of improve the usability of it is having additional sort of metadata about the repositories. Um, in terms of things that people would find useful in locating a repository. Um, and this is something that I've heard is of interest, um, sort of having, you know, a, a box for like, is this um, acceptable for PII or controlled access data? So um, thank you for giving me more data to suggest that the answer to that is yes, we should have such a thing. So I will um, make sure we work on uh, trying to make that part of the redesign. Thanks all. Thank you. I think Nicole and Jess are in a pretty uh, dead heat here. If either one of you wanted to talk about your responses. Jess, I'm happy to go second if you'd like to go first. I just had another question, so I don't know <laughs> how helpful it is, but. I was just curious if anyone is aware of any consortia that are working to pull resources to try to mitigate some of these issues with the high overhead for 
the identification expertise or, you know, like extreme statistical prowess um, to do some of that more intense work. Um, so that's it's just a question. I don't know if anybody else on the call maybe had ideas around that. So if you have a response to that, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Or in the document right behind her question. Um, Nicole. Uh, so, uh, at NYU, there's a lot of discussion about sort of beefing up our de identification side. Um, I do first want to note, I think it's important to differentiate between data that is legally protected and data that is simply sensitive. Uh, I know like Zenodo does have managed access, but I'm not sure if that would qualify um, for what would be legally protected data, although it does qualify for what would maybe just be considered sensitive. Anyway, um, yeah, the the talk happening here is largely to try to increase de-identification and basically lock down any sharing of anything that would have PII. Um, I know there's been talk of using things like Bivli, uh, but the idea being that our higher ups certainly don't want researchers managing uh, requests for PII and managing things like getting IRB approvals, uh, in part because they want our researchers doing research, and in part that they don't necessarily trust research to have the expertise uh, needed to run that sort of workflow. Um, so. I think it is a reasonable approach basically to say uh, to really work on the de-identification side, because as many people have noted, um, there's not many places that can handle legally protected data in a way that at least the legal department at our hospital would be pleased with. So. Thank you. Um, scrolling down, I see Barry A's, uh, with some votes there. So I wanted to unmute them. Okay. I have 1 Barry, so hopefully that's them. Thanks. Yes, I was just adding the point that there are lists of repositories and directories out there, but it's really. Um, mimicking what Lisa was saying about at adding metadata to those lists to more um, make it easier to find repositories and clearly there are a dearth of them at this point that can handle different levels of protected uh, data. And it seems important to maybe tease out um, what Nicole was saying, whether it would hold, you know, it could take sensitive data versus different levels of legally protected data. I mean, there's a lot of detail that we're gonna learn about and need to explicate just for ourselves as well as for the researchers who are uh, making attempts to share their data to comply with this policy. Uh, Justin, can I add one thing that I forgot to mention when I was speaking? Sure. Um, which is just that with the looking into uh, increasing our de-identification uh, abilities at NYU, there's also talks of making template language for these kinds of issues for researchers to use um, for them to really clearly state uh, what data is sensitive, what data is legally protected, what is being shared, and at what level of um, uh, de-identification and which strategies for de-identification. So I think taking the strategy that we seem to be taking, I can't even say we will because it's still a little bit in flux, I think would require very clear template language that's institutional specific for our researchers to use. Thank you. Um, do the people asking questions, the panelists have any responses to that or any new ideas or questions? And or does anyone have a 
burning issue or response, if you want to raise your hand, um, we can have a wild card response. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, we might use this time to gather some feedback from everyone <clears throat> on this document on sort of uh, your thoughts about how the session went and any other uh, ideas for how to organize around these topics in the future. So we have a list of interested people at the top with email addresses. We have some very uh, great questions and responses and interactions here. And so your thoughts on continuing these discussions, what kind of format you might like to see, uh, interactivity and stuff like that. And um, I've also just, uh, there's a, an anonymous feedback form. I'm going to put the link into the chat. So uh, if you have anything else you wanted to share, you can use that form. Um, and just, sorry, I'm going to add as well as part of the NCDS team. Um, that if you have comments on how this was structured, I know we had issues with the document. Um, I feel like this was a creative attempt to engage with the whole community and be participatory. But if you have thoughts on how to make that side of it better, um, we really want to hear them because it's a challenge, but uh, I think this was fun. Yes, this was uh, sort of a pilot of this format. So. So we're also recording this, so if you came in late, um, we'll send out the link to everyone who registered for the recording and the link to the document so you can review later. And again, if you wanted to uh, engage in conversations, you can list your email at the top. And if you see responses in the document that you like, you can feel free to reach out uh, to people who listed their emails. Um, and if you want to come back later and, and provide more feedback, feel free to add to the document afterwards as well. And I, and I'm sure it goes without saying, but the, the list of emails you know, shouldn't be shared with anyone else for any other purpose. All right, thank you everyone. We will stay here. If you have any questions in the chat, you can place them in the chat. And um, even if you want to unmute and talk a little bit, we can do that. Um, but for everyone else, if you uh, wanted to take off, that's fine. And we'll share this stuff out afterwards. Hey, Justin, this is Mary Ellen. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. 
Um, I have a question that is you know, a little bit of a sidetrack from this discussion, but I've been trying to pay attention to what funding opportunities there may be in this area and what kind of you know, stakeholder groups may be the best fit for coming together to um, work on solutions in this area. And what do you see it may be the future? Uh, you know, just from my from my knowledge, which granted, you know, you, that's why I'm asking because I, I want to know what I don't know. But uh, there seems to be funding opportunities sort of at a high level for, um, you know, medical schools or, you know, disciplinary APIs, but, you know, really, at the ground level, uh, we're sort of pitching in with our extra time, and uh, I'm just not sure what's the way forward in that in that regard. What what do you see from your perspective? Uh, I might not be the best person to answer that question, so I might uh, pivot to one of my colleagues, or if anyone has an answer um, that's still here, I'd be glad to hear from you. I don't have an answer either. Uh, I just <laughs> want to say that instead of just giving you nothing, you know. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. That's, that's what I needed to know. I I just intuitively feel like, and this is just from my perspective. Yeah, I'm I'm you know science librarian at a regional comprehensive university. So you know, for from that perspective, uh, it seems like there's there's a lot of good efforts, a lot of different groups. I, I follow the com, um, Campus Computing Research Consortium just as kind of a lurker to see sort of what they're doing. And it just seems like there's there would be an opportunity for these interest groups to come together. But yeah, you kind of, I, I don't know, just not sure where the, um, where the support is going to come for this ground level work. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's where we're at right now. <laughs> just hopefully, eventually, the Reality will um, dictate uh, what's supported. Yeah, I mean, we're hoping to to start up a, a community that can help each other out and at least feel like you're not alone to share in the struggle and um, share information on any opportunities that might be available. So hopefully, we'll build some kind of network around that so you can connect with others who might know. And I'll just also add there that if you are looking to do like a project on helping your institution with like data management and sharing stuff, you could look into IMLS. Uh, they're very, very competitive um, from my experience, um, but uh, worth looking into. And the program officers from IMLS are generally very helpful. So if you wanted to shoot some ideas to them uh, or schedule a meeting, uh, they're generally very receptive. Thank you. And I think that that is one of the things we've discussed in terms of the allowable cost for the DMSPs is that it doesn't allow for any kind of institutional infrastructure. So that, you know, what you're asking about, I think, is is where there's a, a gap and particularly for less well-resourced institutions. Thank you. That's that's good. Good to know. I'm I'm not missing something. I that I didn't know about. But uh, it's it's challenging because, and this is again like something I just want to share because I really want to learn more. But it, you mentioned the well less well resourced institutions and um, you know, yeah, institutions that just don't tend to have as much NIH funding. There's a need to comply to be competitive for grants, but at the same time, uh, you know, everybody's wearing a lot of hats and we sort of uh, need to have the opportunity, I believe, to become more proficient, more knowledgeable in providing these services. And well, it's challenging to do that at the, at the same time that we're wearing a lot of other hats. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, 
or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.